Thank you, Sophie. You're watching Southeast Today, our top story tonight. A warning of a risk to life as the Southeast braces itself for more flooding and the full force of Storm Kieron. We're tidying up, we're not cleaning up. We don't want to have to clean this place and then do it all again tomorrow. We'll have the latest details with our reporters in Hastings and at Southern Waters headquarters in Worthing. Previous years have seen effigies of Donald Trump and Boris Johnson burn for Eden Bridge bonfire, but who got the vote to be this year's guy? And the sky's the limit for young photographer Ellis Skelton, whose work has been wowing judges at a prestigious competition. Welcome to the programme, I'm Charlie Rose. People are being told not to risk their lives by going to the coast as the southeast braces itself for more strong winds and heavy rain overnight, with a Met Office amber weather warning in place for the entire region. Storm Kieron is likely to bring disruption with wind speeds predicted to reach up to 80 miles an hour. The warning comes in at 6 tomorrow morning until 5 in the afternoon. Between 40 to 45 millimetres of rain is expected in many places, similar to the amount some areas saw last weekend. And that rain will fall on ground which is already saturated, increasing the likelihood of flooding. The Environment Agency has issued 24 flood warnings for England by 3 o'clock this morning. Rail operators Southern and Southeastern are urging people to stay at home and not to travel. Cross-channel ferry services are being cancelled and the Kent Resilience Forum, which helps people prepare for emergencies, says people should keep up to date with the latest advice and stay alert if having to make a journey. If you're able to work from home or stay in, please do so. But if you do need to go out, just take extra time, take extra care, especially on rural roads around the county, as there could be a lot of flooding, there could be trees down, etc. You never know what's around the next corner. So please allow extra time and look after yourselves. Well, in a moment, we'll be hearing from our environment correspondent who's been taking a look at the Southern Water Control Centre. But first, let's speak to Piers Hopkirk in Hastings. And Piers, after the flooding last weekend, news of another storm is the last thing residents and businesses there want to hear. Yes, absolutely, Charlie. They've already been dealing with the uh, aftermath of Saturday's extensive flooding in Hastings town centre and here they are facing yet another pummeling from the elements. Business and, businesses and homes have been doing what they can to get themselves prepared as Hastings, like many towns along the south coast, braces itself for impact. The first of a thousand sandbags arriving in Hastings this morning as the town centre seeks to protect itself in any way it can. Richard Martin knows the pain only too well. The basement of his bar flooded waist deep on Saturday. He lost thousands in stock and electrical equipment. Um, it's just unknown of what we're gonna, whether it's going to happen again. Um, we don't want to go through what happened on Saturday um, and also January early this year as well. We should have taken good money on Saturday, but we lost all our takings. We've got bills and staff to pay going into a tough winter anyway, and then we've got this on top of it. Here in Hastings, they're hoping for the best, but planning for the worst. We saw it on Saturday. We saw it nothing like as bad on Monday, but we still saw flooding in basements. Um, I think that the, the, the town is charged with water underneath and, and anything that comes on top of that is, is going to be a massive problem for us. Saturday saw flood water erupt through the town centre for the second time in 10 months. Well, as you can see, we've got a lovely water line going from there two foot, two and a bit foot, Hastings and Rother Furniture Service was one of the many victims. They've paused the clear up here as Storm Kieron threatens a repeat. We are worried, hence why we've not, we're tidying up, we're not cleaning up. We don't want to have to clean this place and then do it all again tomorrow. Um, we've already lost three Luton van worth of, of furniture, which we packed away yesterday. And now, you know, this is the last bit of tiny bit of salvageable and yeah, we might lose that as well. Ahead of the storm, winds are already whipping up the sea. 
with winds expected to reach speeds of up to 85 miles an hour. Storm Kieran is set to create some truly treacherous conditions, especially here on the English Channel. We would ask you to stay well back from the stormy seas and from any cliff edges because we understand that people want to experience extreme weather around our coast, but we would strongly advise anyone for doing so. It's just not worth risking your life. And with climate change, experts warn extreme weather like this will become more common. We're currently seeing 66 mile an hour um, winds in Brighton, for example, in the southeast um, for Storm Kieran, but that will be going closer towards 80, 100 mile an hour gusts as we go into uncharted territory because we've got such extremes and differences in temperature and low pressures. Here they're just hoping they'll be spared scenes like this. Now they can only wait for what Mother Nature has in store. So people here hoping and praying that the rain won't bring a repeat of the flooding that they've seen twice already this year. But as you heard in my report uh, earlier, the, the ground is still pretty saturated and it won't take much rainfall to have a pretty devastating impact. Away from Hastings and across the southeast, Storm Kieron is expected to have a major impact on travel tomorrow. As you've heard, the ferry companies have already cancelled some uh, crossings. Train operators are warning that their timetables are likely to be affected and on the roads with the threat of falling trees and standing water it's likely to be a pretty difficult day on those as well. OK Piers thank you very much. Well Southern Water says it has extra teams and pumps on standby to tackle severe flooding. Our environment correspondent Yvette Austin is at its headquarters in Worthing and Yvette they're going to have their work cut out over the next few days, aren't they? Well, yes, and from what I've seen today, there has been a lot of work going on behind the scenes to try to make sure the company is as ready as it possibly can be, but there is a lot of nervousness. Remember, Southern Water doesn't only deal with sewage, with foul water, it also deals with fresh water too, and flooding doesn't only affect the sewers, it also slows down how quickly water can be got ready to get to our taps. But of course, this is a big storm ahead. It's been testing times over the past few days for the company, and this will be a test too. Southern Water's operations room is on full alert. The company says staffing levels have been doubled for the coming days, 24-7. On the ground, routine maintenance finished, workers at the ready to attend emergencies that might be caused by the fierce weather. Wind is probably the area I'm most concerned with as of, as of today. The 90 mile an hour winds is pretty significant and could lead to power, power outages, which could impact our ability to take waste away or supply wholesome water to customers. So therefore, we're working with the power companies to protect our supplies. And we've also secured 40 what we call mobile generators, so mobile power supplies, to try and keep our sites live, working, to take waste away from customers or to supply them with water. In the incident room, high-tech maps show staff what's happening across the network. All is mostly quiet here at present, but all eyes will be on the likes of key sites like the freshwater treatment works near Rochester. So if we lost our big water supply works that area, which is Burham, this would be very, very heavily populated with lots of red dots. For the wastewater system, the company has a new piece of kit to help. Thousands of sensors have been placed in sewer manholes to detect blockages. We have about 24,000 of these monitors across our estate and they're there to proactively alert us to a problem on the network so we can respond more speedily to prevent an environmental problem, a pollution, or prevent flooding to customers. But again, the what the tool has enabled us to do is to really distinguish between a blockage and flow of water, which is why it's quite an effective tool. In Hastings, which was severely flooded on Saturday, there's extra help to deal with the expected heavy rain. So what we've been doing and working very closely with, with Hastings Council is putting in a 1,000 litre a second pump um, into the area to take away that, that rainwater if it were to occur, occur again. For context, that's about 43 Olympic sized swim, swimming pools a day we can pump out to the to the sea. So that should, aside some other sort of smaller actions, mitigate the risk to customers with, with Storm Kieran. With the emergency plan in place, staff now wait to implement it. 
So the big worry is that the strong winds will tear down trees, will tear down power lines and knock out the treatment works. You heard there that the company is bringing in generators as a backup plus a program for refueling them. But bottled water is being prepared just in case. Enough for 40,000 customers a day for however long it's needed. And tankers, yes, 150 of them that take the sewage away from wherever ends up and where it shouldn't be. I think they are expecting expecting problems though because they've sent out nearly a million text messages to customers and more than 800,000 emails to provide advice and information. We'll wait and see now as to whether what's been forecast actually materialises. Yvette, thank you. And you can get live updates throughout the day from 6 o'clock tomorrow morning on the BBC News app and on BBC Radio's Kent, Sussex and Surrey. We'll also have bulletins throughout the morning on South East today as well as at uh, 1.30 lunchtime and 6.30 in the evening. And please send us your pictures and videos to South East today at bbc.co.uk or by going to Facebook, Twitter and Instagram. Now, in other news, the police officer who arrested Louis de Zoiza before he shot dead Sergeant Matt Ratner in a police custody suite has told a coroner he thought he carried out a thorough search. Matt Ratner, who was head coach at East Grinstead Rugby Club, was killed three years ago. The inquest into his death is now underway, as Sarah Smith reports. If you're walking down the road with a duffel bag, all right, which I, which I believe may have stuff going to equip to do a burglary, all right? Louis de Souza was stopped by police because his bag and his big coat on a warm night made him a suspect for a spate of burglaries. When officers found bullets in his pockets, he was arrested and searched. But it was the thoroughness of that search which was being interrogated today. In the police van, de Souza, though handcuffed, got a gun he had in a holster into his hands. At the police station, it was Sergeant Ratner who was to oversee another search. The suspect pulled out the gun and shot him in the chest. Welcome to East Grinstead Rugby Football Club. It's now three years since Matt Ratner died. A police officer for 30 years and a much-loved coach at East Grinstead Rugby Club, a foundation has been set up in his name to help disadvantaged youngsters get involved in the sport he loved. While de Souza has been jailed for life for murder, the inquest is looking at the actions of everyone that night. The arresting officer, when asked why he'd not found the gun, said he believed he'd carried out as thorough a search as possible beside the road. Was not finding it human error, he was asked. Correct, he replied. The inquest is due to last for three weeks. Sarah Smith, BBC South East Today. Patients are being put at risk due to an increase of thousands more people joining waiting lists every month, causing unprecedented demand, according to East Kent Hospital NHS Trust. It says that a winter plan has been prioritised and that multiple initiatives have been brought in to tackle the growing backlog. And one of the oldest bonfire societies in East Sussex is restricting access to its celebrations after the parade this year. Cliff Bonfire Society in Lewis has organised firework night events for around 170 years. This year it's cancelled public ticket sales with access to its fire site on Saturday now open only to members. Now two years after the death of their baby, a West Sussex couple say they're still unclear what led to his death. Orlando was born severely disabled at Worthing Hospital following complications that began during a home birth. He passed away soon afterwards. His parents, who are from Brighton, allege serious failings in the care they received, which they believe resulted in the loss of their baby boy. Alastair Fee reports. I mean, it's just crazy to think that we should have a two-year-old. Two years ago, Robin and Johnny were preparing to welcome their son into the world. They had planned a home birth, but there were problems. I felt in several ways something wasn't going well. Um, I felt poorly. I felt like I wasn't actually in the room anymore. I felt like my son was stuck. Robin, herself a trained midwife, was eventually transferred to the maternity unit at Worthing Hospital. Four hours later, she had a seizure, which led to an emergency caesarean section. Our son was actually dead on delivery and was then resuscitated. The diagnosis was absolutely worst case scenario and therefore we were told by the consultant team 
soon after that that they had made the decision they thought it was in his best interest to move from um, intervention care to keep him alive to palliative care. Hi, buddy boy. The couple named him Orlando. He lived for just two weeks. During the many months since his birth, an inquest into his death has been delayed twice. An investigation by the National Midwifery Council was sparked by concerns from the family after they reviewed the hospital's notes. That investigation is ongoing. The family say Sussex NHS Foundation Trust has not provided an adequate explanation of what happened to their son while under its care. Nothing's ever going to bring him back, nothing's ever going to erase those memories, nothing is actually going to physically help us. But we need to have accountability as to what happened to us. In a statement, University Hospital's Sussex NHS Trust has said, We know that the loss of Orlando has been intensely traumatic and upsetting for his family. Senior staff visited in person to offer our deep sympathy for their terrible experience. We expect the inquest to take place next spring and we will do everything we can to support the coroner in that process. We want to be open, to listen and to seek to improve care for mothers and babies if we possibly can. The Trust needs to acknowledge that this shouldn't have happened because I can tell you it is world shattering. The day that our, our son passed away, a, a very large portion of myself and my wife passed away that day as well. And that will stay with you for the rest of your life. An inquest into Orlando's death is expected to take place next spring. Alistair Fee, BBC South East Today. Now, he's only 17 years old, but Ellis Skelton's stunning photos of his local area around Eastbourne are already turning the heads of judges at a major national competition. Up against 17,000 entrants, not one, but two of Ellis's photos have been highly commended. His shot of a starling murmuration over Eastbourne Pier and his picture of a snow-covered South Downs. We'll be speaking to Ellis and his mum Sarah in a moment, but first, let's take a look at some of his work. Very pleased to say Ellis and his mum are with me now. Ellis, well, first of all, thank you both for joining us. And Ellis, congratulations um, on your success in this prestigious competition. How does it feel to have your work recognised in this way? It's amazing to be able to share my work with so many people around, around the world, really, because mm. so many people get to view these things, like it's going to be done on an exhibition around London in a few weeks' time. Uh, it's in a book. So yeah, I'm really excited. And railway stations as well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. The busiest places you could imagine. So yeah. all up and all over the UK. So I'm really excited. Yeah. Well, let's uh, let's uh, take a look at uh, these uh, photos that have, that have done so well. First, the Starling murmuration, which is uh, which was taken at Eastbourne Eastbourne Pier, wasn't it? Yeah. Tell it me was. about that. How did that come about? So my Starling murmuration was actually taken during the Blue Hour, which is a time which many photographers struggle shooting in because it's really dark. Um, but it's so amazing when you can get those amazing colours, which, as you can see, was blue and purple. Was the sky really that colour? It was, yeah. So mm -hmm. it's absolutely amazing. It was actually after a lot of the photographers had already picked up their stuff and gone home, because many people think, oh, after sunset, there's not much point being out, but I decided to stick around and see what I could capture. Well, that paid off, didn't it? It did, yeah. And there's another very special photo that's, that's in the book there, which is a shot of the South Downs during a during winter time. Tell me about that. Yes, that's a very unusual one because as you know we don't get much snow here in Sussex. Mm. So that was early in the morning. School got cancelled so mm. I decided to quickly run out with my camera. 
on the South Downs in Eastbourne and I quickly got the picture. Uh, and that was during the sunrise where you get all those really unusual orange colours through the mist. So. Do you get frozen fingers? No, not at all. <laughs> but yeah, I was out for quite a while getting different snaps and yeah, it was great fun. So mum, if school wasn't shut, that photo would have never, uh, exactly. would never have materialised, exactly. would it? Exactly. No, most, most definitely not. <laughs> and uh, it was early in the morning. Um, where were you, mum? You let um, Ellis run up the South Downs on his own. Oh, I was getting ready for work. I, um, I run loads of um, local church toddler groups in Eastbourne, so I was heading off ready to set up, actually for our Christmas party at the time, um, mm. at the toddler group. Well, Ellis said, oh, I'm going to shoot off and up with my camera on the downs. And, <laughs> and uh, were you wondering where he worked, where he was, where he got to? We're, we're quite used to Ellis uh, um, disappearing off the earlier hours of the morning to catch various sunrises around mm. Eastbourne, so it was yeah. nothing new. <laughs> Did he inherit his photography skills from you then? Oh no, most definitely not. <laughs> <laughs> um, 17,000 entrants in this competition, Ellis. Yeah, it's amazing. Um, it's a lot more than the past previous few years. Um, Charlie Wake, the founder, actually said that this year it's been incredible to see how many people had entered. There are more young people this year, but also more women as well. So it was great to see so many people and it was amazing to get into the last, last few in the finals. And what people don't know is that the vast majority of people you're up against were adults who are very, very experienced. Yeah, so um, I can't think of how many, but there's quite a few adult entries. Mm. Um, and even the youth ones, in fact, the adult and youth, they're all amazing this year, incredible mm. pictures. So yeah. it's great to be among them and to be able to see all their work. So you were highly commended in Landscape Photographer of the Year, yes. twice for these two photos. Must be really proud, man. Oh, ever so proud. Yeah. <laughs> um, most of us mere mortals don't have big cameras, we just have our smartphones. What are your top tips, Ellis, for taking a, uh, a successful photo? Because mine keep coming out blurry. <laughs> Um, best technique I'd say is lighting. I think it's the most important thing and that's what I try to capture all my photographs. Um, usually during sunrise, sunsets is my favourite time to photograph because you get that nice soft lighting. Um, it's always about composition as well is another really important rule. If you can try trying to try frame it in the right place, adds all that balance and you know, Mm. get a really nice looking picture which is eye pleasing to look at. And you've got to get up very very early yes. in the morning haven't you? Yeah, <laughs> in the snow. Early. Yeah, so the earlier the better. Yeah, and obviously you want to make a career out of this and you're going to enter more competitions so I wish you the very best of luck and congratulations. They're beautiful photos. So <laughs> thank you. Thank you very much to both of you for coming in to talk to us about right. it. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Well from photography to football and Gillingham have appointed Stephen Clements as their new head coach. This will be his first job in management after previous spells as an assistant manager at Aston Villa and Newcastle United. Replacing Neil Harris, Stephen Clements' first match will be on Saturday, a trip to Hereford in the FA Cup. Now, past targets have included Boris Johnson and Donald Trump, but which public figure will be burnt on a stake at this year's Eden Bridge bonfire? It's always highly anticipated, but we can now reveal that this year's celebrity guy is London Mayor Sadiq Khan, responsible, of course, for the expansion of the ultra-low emission zone to cover the whole of Greater London bordering Kent and Surrey. It comes as nearly a thousand crimes linked to ULEZ cameras being stolen or vandalised have been recorded by police in seven months. Peter Whittlesey reports. It's a village institution that's followed around the world. The person who has inflamed the folk of Edenbridge is turned into an effigy and burned alongside Guy Fawkes. This year, it's Sadiq Khan for expanding London's ultra-low emission zone to just 10 miles from the Kent town. I think for the first time, one of, the, one of our celebrity guys is because they've had an impact on the lives of people living and working in Edenbridge itself. Uh, we've got local businesses who, uh, you know, would be travelling into that zone who are now being charged for it. Uh, we've got people who are perhaps giving care over the borders into, into the zone. If you live in a news vacuum, you might not realise why ULEZ is unpopular. Well, if your motor doesn't comply, you have to pay £12.50 a day to enter the zone. Those that don't cough up and are captured on camera are fined. Those cameras are highlighted in this effigy. What's different about the guy this year is the fact that we didn't do his face because we didn't want to do the, uh, we didn't want to do the um, politician and we thought it would be uh, interesting to do something different and um, not giving a person a face um, and the camera who is the main uh, reason why we've chosen him. 
That's artistic license because they're bored of painting politicians. In previous years, the figures of fun have been Katie Price, Wayne Rooney as Shrek, and of course, Donald Trump. But with nearly a thousand ULES cameras vandalized or stolen, this year's pick is very topical. They will be taking the focal point of our big fireworks extravaganza that's taking place at 8.30 on Saturday evening. And that will be after our big procession, which we've got about 550 participants within our procession this year. It's the town's biggest event, but don't worry, there is parking, even for non-compliant ULES vehicles, in walking distance from the site. Peter Whittlesey, BBC South East Today. Well, lots of fun being had at Edenbridge, but will the weather dampen spirits over the next few days? Here to tell us is uh, Nina Ridge. Nina, what can we expect? Well, for the weekend, it seems a long way off at the minute, doesn't it? We've got to get through tomorrow's forecast, of course, with our storm on its way. Now, we had a little bit of a lull in the weather this afternoon whilst we started off today with some cloud and some rain. Actually, skies brightened this afternoon. There was a bit of sunshine, still kept a few showers around. But, of course, the forecast is all about how things are going to change over the next 24 hours as our storm arrives. The winds will pick up through the night tonight. Six o'clock tomorrow morning, our amber war... war warning comes into force. This is the zone. It's a fairly narrow zone. The wind's quite widely through tomorrow, expected to 60, 70 miles an hour. They could be stronger through the English Channel coast and to the north of this, they're not as strong, 50 to 60 miles an hour. And that's why there's a yellow warning in force there. Now, the position of the low is critical to where we'll see the strongest of the winds. The models have been pushing it a little bit further south, but I think we're still in the firing line. The centre of the low, the winds will be very light. So you can see why the warnings are more severe through the Channel Islands and northern France here really bearing the brunt of it and as you head towards us the tightly packed isobars. The winds are expected to be at their strongest for tomorrow morning and then as we go through Thursday afternoon that low just starts to fill and weaken heading out into the North Sea the isobars open up and so the winds will gradually start to fall a little lighter. Now through this evening we'll see heavy rain of course that's the other problem as the strong winds the ground saturated the worst of the wet weather is overnight in towards the early hours with temperatures at 10 to 12 degrees. The black circles indicate our wind gusts so through the night you can see at around 40 to 50 miles an hour. They then pick up even further through the morning. The main area of rain will clear away to the east and then a scattering of showers moving through fairly quickly but it will be how strong those winds will get which will really determine the disruption. You can see how they're strongest through the channel and then as we push further north the wind gusts more like 40 to 50 miles an hour. I think as we go through overnight Thursday into Friday that's when the winds start to fall a little lighter. Friday is looking a more typical autumnal day. Blustery yes just with a few scattered showers Charlie. And the next 24 hours is a worrying time especially for people living in areas prone to flooding. Nina Absolutely. thank you very much. And I'll be back with an update uh, tonight at half past ten here on BBC One. I hope to see you then. Goodbye. <laughs>